Hello, and welcome to tonight's webinar on teleautometry and how to grow your practice. My name is Bob Iacello. I'm the National Sales Director for 2020 Now. And tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Chad Overman, who has over 25 years of experience. He started his career as an independent optometrist, then took on a senior leadership role in corporate optometry, leading over 4,000 optometrists. He has an, he's an industry consultant to multiple companies focused on providing quality and affordable access to care. He's a clinical advisor and chief optometrist at 2020 Now. So welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Overman. Thanks for having me, Bob. Sure thing. We also are joined by Dr. Mike Rothschild. He's a private practice optometrist and founder of Leadership OD, a company dedicated to excellence in optometric practice. Dr. Rothschild is an international speaker who's built a successful practice and recently founded a new practice focused on delivering comprehensive exams through teleoptometry. He's an authority on delivering eye care through all forms of telemedicine. Thank you for joining us as well, Dr. Rothschild. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Sure. So just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A. Appreciate everyone taking time out of their evening to join us tonight. If you would like to come on camera, we'd love to have you come up and ask your question live if we have time, depending on the number of questions we have. But please do enter at the end of your question live if you're comfortable having me unmute you and join us for, for, for a discussion. So certainly would welcome that and, and would be you know more interactive, of course. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to, to get us started. Dr. Chad Overman is going to give us a little bit more about his background. Each of the panelists is going to give us a few minutes about their experience with teleoptometry, kind of go a little bit more in depth, and then we'll, we'll dive into Q&A. Okay, thank you so much. Dr. Overman? Thank, yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, so I've been a consultant uh, in the industry now for the last five years and um, an optometrist for 25. And... I really like to look into different things. I started off uh, doing a lot with dry eye when I first uh, became a consultant, helping doctors. How do you put that into the flow of your practice? How do you make it work for the bottom line? Did the same thing then with, with retina. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I started watching the telehealth space and got very interested in what's going on, um, you know, like, the majority of you out there, I wasn't really interested in an online refraction type of an exam. Uh, and so I started looking at the different telehealth companies out there. And that's when I really landed with 2020 because of the comprehensive exam that they're doing. It's, it's as comprehensive an eye exam as I think you can give without having the dilation. Uh, I think that's something... Uh, it may come up as some questions, and I love the fact, Bob, that you have this a uh, question and answer type of uh, format. Uh, I think having Dr. Mike on here is going to help us tremendously uh, answer the questions that, that our group has. So I'm very excited to, to be here today. Um, I'm always learning. I learn from Mike every time uh, that I get a chance to talk to him. And I think uh, with this format that we have, I'll be able to answer some questions, uh, you know, as face-to-face -face as we can get right now. So I uh, greatly appreciate being here. That's great. We'll um, turn that over to Dr. Rothschild for an introduction and kind of your experience, if you can go into your experience with teleoptometry and how you're practicing teleoptometry. Absolutely. Um, Bob, I, I brought a few slides that I wanted to uh, to share with everybody just to sort of uh, get a sense of kind of what we're looking at. Give me, I'm having some, I guess you're all seeing my screen um, working on this together. But, but before I get started, what I wanted to do, I don't, like Chad was saying, I'm really excited about this just being a conversation, but I wanted to kind of let you know a little bit about who I am and where I come from and, uh, and what, what my experience has been. So, Going back about 25 years or so, I started a, a practice in my wife's hometown, and it was a, a practice that I started from scratch in Carrollton, Georgia, which is a, a relatively small uh, town outside of Atlanta. And we just started from nothing and just built it up to a, a, a relatively good primary optometry practice where we just took care of everything. And uh, we grew that up and I wound up selling that practice to focus on my consulting business, my coaching business, because I was really interested in sort of helping practices get started. And, and so for, for the last several years, I was building up and, and talking to different doctors 
uh, different eye care practices all across the country, big, small, remote, urban. And I started picking up over the years on, on one really, really disturbing trend uh, that's going on. And that's uh, decreased access to, to eye care, uh, but really it's expanded into healthcare, particularly in remote rural areas of our country. Um, and I also like working with students. I'm a, a, a part-time professor over at the University of Alabama, Birmingham in the optometry school. We're finding that newer optometrists are, are not wanting to live in these rural areas. So there's, there's this growing gap of people trying to get access in this in this area. So like Chad, I began exploring and started thinking, what, what are some of the things that we can do to solve this problem? And I was involved in, um, you know, hearing about some of these online refractions and some of these tools, these apps, if you will, that can give you uh, the, some eyeglass numbers as they were calling them. Um, and so you can bypass the eye exam. And I was just as uncomfortable as all of us about that, but I knew that the technology was there. Uh, that we should be able to, to see our patients. So I was in a position to try something new, try something different. And I wanted to explore this teleoptometry concept and see how good it could be. I didn't trust it. I didn't know how good it could be, but I wanted to try it. And I thought that the, really the only way to, to try it out was to start a new practice and just go all in. So I started looking for different companies and I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that we were in a position that we could give high quality care um, without the do doctor necessarily being there and to just see how good it could be. So I looked for a company that offered all of these, uh, you know, when a patient would go into a practice, what, what's the equipment, what's the data that we can bring in effectively without a doctor being there? How can we do the one in and the two in a subjective interactive refraction um, online? You know, how does it, does that technology exist and how can we be face to face with our patients? And all of that coming together was what I was looking for. And I was lucky enough to come in contact with the people at 2020 now. And that's exactly what they deliver. So I started a new practice and uh, with this concept, and this was the whole idea of what we did. So we started it uh, to see how good of a job we could do with this. And so uh, when we go into our practice, you know, it, it looks like a, any other practice, you know, we've got an optical, we've got a reception area, but once our patients check in utilizing the 2020 system, we, we capitalized on it. And so this tablet that you see this gentleman using, this is a patient that uh, really came into our office and he's entering in his uh, medical history, which is uploaded into the system so that the doctor, whether it's me being a remote doctor on site or whether I'm off site or whether I'm using one of the 2020 now doctors, um, whoever is looking at that is able to uh, analyze that information in real time while the patient's uh, doing that. And then they go into a pretest room and we're able, we just went with the equipment that gets us the best diagnostic data that we can. So we've got instruments, you know, that have auto refraction and uh, topography. Uh, of course, we take fundus pictures, we get pressures. We also get an optimap. We also have a wavefront analysis, which gives us a good angle of the image. It's got pupil testing. So all of this is done and with remote, or excuse me, with digital equipment, it's all uploaded so that it can be analyzed while a subjective refraction is going on. So the way that this works is a, uh, this technician uh, works for 2020 now, certified ophthalmic medical technician, zooms in just like we're zoomed in together and talks to the patient in the exam room and uh, is able to control this phoropter uh, this digital phoropter and change the lenses while she's asking the patients, which is better one or two. And she's able to do that and go back and forth to get these answers while the doctor, again, whether it's me or, or a different doctor is able to look at the, the history, the complaints, everything, everything that's going on with the patient. And then we log on and we actually talk to the patient after this refraction is going on. And guys, this is the point that surprised me the most and, and the thing that is most exciting to me about learning about this whole technology is I knew the millennials would love it. You know, they don't have to see a doctor in person. You know, you don't have to be there. But, but 
every age group has really enjoyed the interaction that you can have with a patient. Our eye exams, all of our eye exams in my practice and in your practice, we're utilizing more and more of this digital technology. We're, we're driving our eye exams with data. And if we go into the exam room and look at a computer, we're looking away from our patient. And that connection between patients and doctors is decreasing and has been over the years. And this is actually taking it back the other way. And that was a surprise to me. I didn't expect that. I, was, I put all these safeguards in place to make sure we stayed connected with the patient, not even realizing that it was going to naturally happen because while I'm looking at this data and I've already looked at it and I can share my screen and show them what I'm looking at, but I'm also looking at the patient and the data at the same time. And just by putting that screen there, we actually have a really, really good connection that is better than I ever imagined. And I say, I think that from a patient connection perspective, this is the surprising thing to me. It's, it's better in many cases than having the patient come in and seeing them in person simply because of the way that we look at them. And so that's really the, all that I've got is uh, and, and to show you today and just wanted to, to have some conversations with you about it about what our experience has been, but I've really, really enjoyed the process and have learned along the way that I think that the best way to do this is incorporate it. It can be incorporated into any kind of practice to expand what you're able to deliver and focus on the things that are, are most important to you. So that's, that's who I am and where I've come from and a very, very brief history of, of my experience in teleoptometry. Mike, I really appreciate all of that. Uh, you know, when I, when I picked 2020 now, I picked it because I felt it was as close to the standard of care of an in-person exam as you can possibly be. But I think a lot of doctors, that's a lot of the questions I get. Can you touch on that a little bit, what you feel about the standard of care, uh, what you're doing with 2020 now versus an in-person? Yeah, so I feel like we're, we're, we're certainly meeting the standard of care for comprehensive eye exams. Uh, in many cases, we're exceeding it. So, so if you think about what it is that you're worried that you're not capturing, what, it, what, are, what are you worried that you're, you're possibly missing? And so I think as long as a doctor is communicating with a patient, you know, in real time, looking at the data, then the doctor is able to make their best clinical judgment based on everything that's going on. And uh, if you're worried that you're missing something, um, you do just what you would do if you worry about if you're missing it in the exam room. You know, you've got uh, patients that you're just unable to get pressure on either because they're not gonna cooperate with you or, and you just have to decide, do I need this patient? Um, how badly do I need to know what the pressure is? Do I need to, I've worked in practices where we, uh, actually put the, the patient under anesthesia so that we could check their pressure. That's how badly we needed to know what their pressure was. But most of the time you can make the clinical judgment whether you can get it or not. So for a standard exam, we're able to get all sorts of refractive readings. We're able to get a subjective interactive refraction, all sorts of health evaluations, whether it's uh, uh, digital images of slit lamp, uh, fundus, wide angle uh, retinal images, an OCT of the angle so that we can grade that and we get to talk to the patient. I think as long as you can talk to the patient, you can make an assessment of whether this is adequate for their yearly exam or not. And you can certainly have the ability to meet the standard of care every time. Yeah, I like that. I do a lot of, um, I mean, my role at 2020 now is, is how, do, how do we do as much as we can? We want to make it as, as efficient as possible, but we want to keep that standard of care. Um, the doctors that from 2020 that would be reading from you, I audit their charts. I make sure that they're, you know, doing the things uh, that they need to be doing. Um, but it's kind of my role to make sure that they get everything that they need so that they can make a clinical judgment. Uh, and, you know, I've been to your office. I love it. It's uh, set up awesome. Uh, I think, uh, you know, can you Talk a little bit about your technicians uh, and any challenges you had setting all of that up. Yeah, so, you know, our technicians are 
amazing. Let me just say that, that one of our technicians, our, who's now our office manager, worked with me uh, in my previous practice, and she grew up, and uh, when she was in high school, she worked with me as a, as a part-time technician, and then uh, our, we went our separate ways, and we came back together, and so we were experienced working together. And then our other technician named Maelle, who I see as uh, an attendee on the call, I'm glad that she made it here, um, but she, she was a beginner. She had never worked in eye care in any capacity at all and is just a rock star uh, for us in everything that she does. But she came in not learning anything. So we taught her how to use the instruments and everybody's taught some, you know, someone how to utilize these instruments, but she's able to utilize these instruments, uh, run through the process, you know, put the patient in the room and help out in the optical as well, you know, with, uh, with glasses and, and contact lenses. But the training that 2020 now gave my staff blew me away. When they told me what they were going to do, I thought that's too good to be true. But it was true. They came and they taught my staff from from one who had some experience working in a different type practice, one who had zero experience and taught us how to utilize this process. And we customized the process so that it fit what we've got, but they're constantly learning. And when something goes wrong, the 2020 now team is who we respond to. So if the machine doesn't send the information like it's supposed to, we send a message to the uh, team at 2020 now to start the diagnosing process to figure out, you know, what we're going to do about it. But yeah, teaching the staff how to utilize it, you know, we've got their processes in place and they keep it running. That's awesome. You know, I, I think Bob, between Mike and myself on this call, uh, I think we're going to be able to answer, you know, all the questions that come up. I uh, I see that we we have at least one question. Do you do you want to start into some of that, and then Mike yeah. and I can talk forever about these. We're, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very passionate about this, so um, I'm sure people could listen to us all night long. But you know, let's make sure we get all the questions answered. Is that's really our purpose tonight? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a couple questions coming through. Again, reminder: if you have a question and you want to come on and speak live, and and you know. O- open up your camera, have a dialogue, just uh, put live at the end of your question. So I'll, I'll know to unmute and bring you up. Uh, first question that came through there was from was from uh, Jerry Ellis in terms of cost of, of equipment to provide the exam. I think that's something that I can address real quickly. It's um, it's really going to be dependent on the the technology that you already have in your your office. So if generally speaking, you have you know the latest digital equipment. Um, it could be a very negligible cost just for our software and our connectivity, our training. Um, you know, if you're building out a brand new office or lane like like Mike did, you know, you could be looking at, you know, $80,000 for everything from, and this is, I guess we could go over, Chad, if you just want to kind of give a rundown of the bare minimum equipment that you would need. But, you know, a digital ferropter, digital slit lamp, and then Mike, if, um, I'm sorry, um, Chad, if you just want to give a quick rundown to give them an idea of the, the, the minimum technology in order for us to do a comprehensive exam. Yeah, I think you've you got choices, right? You uh, visual fields, fundus photography, um, certainly would like wide field fundus photos or, or ultra wide. Um, Mike, I think uh, if I'm correct, you're using a, a compass also. Um, and maybe yeah, that's a right. Visionics 120. Is that you we, have that we, use a, we use the Visionics. I'm not sure if it's the 120 or which one it is, but it does the uh, has multiple makes many measurements. We use the compass for a visual field and the retinal camera, and we use the optos for the wide angles images, yeah. which so is overdoing got, it a bit. Well, I mean, you got a lot of choices there. That's yeah. I mean, to if you wanted to keep costs down, I don't think you would use both the compass and the optos. Um, you know, Mike, I don't think you said pachymetry, but you do get pachymetry also um, yep. with your, your Visionics. Uh, that's a, a very good device, gets you a lot of things. We can customize though, Bob, I think is where you were going there with that uh, answer. Um, you know, what do you want? What do you need? I'll, I'll talk to a lot of uh, docs and, you know, they'll have some of the equipment they won't have some others, you know, I'll, I'll give them some choices. Um, you can get used equipment, uh, you know, you can keep this uh, fairly under control. Um, but in the end, you know, even using the more expensive equipment, it pays for itself. 
So there's there's certainly uh, you know good ROI uh, on that. So it's hard in a I guess uh, to get down to the the nuts and bolts exact numbers, but um, I think that would be a great one, Bob. Uh, maybe if we could get the uh, question questioner uh, offsite, you know, we can have a discussion with them as well. I, I, I'd like to add this too, if it's okay. I think that most established modern um, eye care practices are going to have most of what you need already because you've already got these digital devices that you're utilizing. Maybe the digital foropter, a lot of practices don't have, but but a lot of it you've already got in your practices. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add one thing to that, that, uh, you know, 2020 now has, um, Bob, or is it over 13 or 14 OEMs that, so you, you don't have to, if you already have some digital equipment, 2020 now can probably integrate with it already. And I know that was a big issue with, uh, you know, others providing telehealth is they, they can't do that. So you end up having to buy a lot more equipment. Uh, so it's something that I think the, the integration paths are already there for, as Mike was saying, the equipment that you may already have in your practice. Yeah, that's great. There, there, was, there was a couple similar questions in here. Jeff Poe asked a, a similar question in terms of, uh, can a practice use its own, own equipment or do I need to use 2020 now to find equipment as a 10 year old auto refractor capable of meeting 2020 now standards? And again, it's a matter of what we can integrate with. We're integrated with 18 different OEMs at this point. The, the best step, what we typically do with a customer who's interested in, in looking into this is we'll do an analysis of what equipment you have, make a model. So we could take that offline, reach out to me, you know, either through, through email, through our website or contact form. Um, you, you've all received my email address, so we can set up a time to talk or you can send me a list of the equipment that you have, make and models, and we can run an analysis and, and really get you down to what equipment you might need to upgrade or what equipment you can you can integrate with our system. So it's a, it's a great question. Again, anyone that has those questions would love to, to help you out and figure out exactly what it would take to integrate with that. Um, a couple, you know, so we have a, a number of questions that came through here. Again, if you want to come up live, I'm not going to force anyone, but if you want to come up live and uh, just type the word live somewhere in your question, and uh, I'll bring you to come up here. So um, there was a question from, from Douglas Walker, a little bit more in depth, would have loved to come, come up live to talk about this, but uh, he had three foreign body removal patients today. That would have been a challenge remotely. Of course, yes. are, are the 2020 now docs licensed in several states? Some state boards are embracing telehealth, but require at least one face-to-face -face evaluation to determine an established relationship. Um, I'll kick this one over to Chad. There's, there's a couple components to that one. So it's, you're correct. There's uh, state by state. There are some different regulations. Again, it's a conversation we can have live one-on-one -on -one where I can tell you exactly what the legalities are in each, each state. Most of the states are, are definitely open to this. I'll, I'll go over to, to Chad in terms of, there's, there's kind of a couple components to that question. Let's break up the first one, which is, there are a number of things that doctors do on a routine exam that they say you can't, you can't do remotely. And I think we, we all agree with that. So let's walk through a case scenario like that where, um, Chad, I think it's an interesting case. A patient comes in, they were signed up for a remote exam, and then Dr. Rothschild, I'm sure you, you have this happen too. And then at some point during that exam, it, you know, something is identified that that's going to be a medical intervention. Could you kind of walk through what the process is there? Start with Chad and then uh, Mike, maybe you can share your experience. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it on more of a broad scale. And then maybe Mike can go down and talk about what he would do at his practice. But what I suggest for doctors to do is if, if it's a 2020 now doctor that's doing the exam, we want to know who you would want us to refer the patient to. So if we're, if we believe it's primary open angle glaucoma or, you know, a foreign body is something that needs to be taken care of a little bit quicker, um, is there somebody that you would want us to refer to? But I've also, I know I told this face to face to Mike one time, I want you in the practice at some point during the week so that you can refer a lot of the medical to yourself. Now, again, a foreign body removal, we need to take care of that now. Maybe there's somebody down the road you want us to send them to. Maybe you want us to contact you and you'll meet the patient to come in and take care of them. There's a lot of scenarios and 
you know, I, I challenge docs to come up with new scenarios to see, is there something else that we need to work on? But in the end, the, the big answer is you're going to refer these patients for that follow-up care. It's just whether is it going to be to you or is it going to be to someone else? So, Mike, I'll kick that to you. If you had someone come in and you weren't in the office, um, what would you do? Yeah, so I, I'd like to just to give two, two examples. So first, if somebody, when foreign bodies come in, uh, three in one day, it's funny how they run in threes, isn't it? So, so somebody call, typically when somebody gets something in their eye, they call and they say, I've got something in my eye. And so you don't schedule them to come in for that if there's not a doctor there. But a lot of times, this is something that can be utilized while you're in the office. So if you're in the office seeing patients, 2020 now can be seeing your comprehensive exams you know, in a different area of your office. So sometimes you're there anyway, but you just schedule it and you do whatever you do. If they call on the weekend or if you're not available, uh, send them to a colleague, uh, like Chad said, meet them up there so that you can get that out of their eye. But you can't, you can't do that, but you can certainly say it and you can talk to them and work on a plan together with them. But we did have a situation where a patient came in just recently, and this was a, an interesting story. It wasn't devastating. Um, but if you see something that you can't handle remotely, you just get a plan, just like you do any other time. So uh, the 2020 now doctors that we work with, um, Dr. White will get on Google and, and find somebody to, you know, with a specialty if she's worried about glaucoma. Uh, even though she's not from the area, she can do some research and find out exactly what that patient needs. But we had a patient uh, recently, a kid, he was, I say a kid, he was, 25 years old or something. And, um, and the, the technician could not correct his vision to 2020. And there was no real, you couldn't see anything obvious of why he didn't, couldn't get to 2020. So you, we've all done those, had those exams where we just struggle and you just one and two of them and three and four of them. And you're at 99 or a hundred and you're just not getting, making any headway. So Dr. Panda gets on, does his evaluation. Technician says, uh, best corrected to, I don't know, 2030 or 2040. And Dr. Pandit looks at the topography and sees that it's distorted. It's bad. Something's wrong. And while he doesn't necessarily uh, definitively diagnose it from a topography and, and a reading, he refers them back. And they come back on a day where we can do more specific testing and put them in scleral lenses and figure out exactly what the problem is. So that's what you do. Just like any other patient, when you come across something you can't handle, with what you've got there, you go to plan B. That's a great way to put it, Mike. And you, you touched on something there um, that I also want to bring up that you were talking about doing the comprehensive exams, you know, while you're doing something else. And, you know, you told me one time that uh, you would rather do other things, whether it's glaucoma, dry eye, scleral lenses, um, and you let 2020 do a lot of the more standard comprehensive eye exams. Can you touch on that just a little bit? Maybe expand on that thought? Every optometrist that I've ever worked with, after they've been uh, spinning and grinning for about five or 10 years, um, always come across something that, that's their passion, right? And it's, it's different for everybody. Sometimes it's vision therapy or low vision or sports vision scleral lenses. I, I do. I like glaucoma. I just, I like glaucoma. I like treating it. I don't lecture about it much, but it's, I like dealing with the patients in that situation, but everybody's got something that, that becomes their passion that they want to work with. And what tends to happen is, is what they're working on sort of takes a, either that takes a back seat so that they can do what I call the meat and potatoes part of eye, uh, eye exams, just do these eye exams that pay the bills or those eye exams suffer so that they can chase this passion that they've got. And, um, and this is just such a great solution for that because you can be there if things do go wrong and if they, they're, they're not, you know, don't fall directly into place, but you can kind of keep the engine running uh, with, with what they take care of because these doctors, you can, you can see them, you can be their doctor, or you can turn it over to the 2020 now doctors, which is my preference because I know them, I trust them. We get together every once in a while and kind of talk about how things are going. And I know that they're going to take good care of my patients, just like an associate that you, you would bring into your office. They're going to 
educate them. But again, they have that good face to face just because of the nature of doing this and they make recommendations for what my patients need out in the optical. And Bob, I think uh, there was another part to that question about state specific, you know, all of the 2020 now doctors uh, are licensed in the state that they're seeing patients and they may have multiple licenses. So they may be doing it in, in multiple states. I think state regulations and licensing, even though there's still a few states out there that you know may not be all for it, uh, there's a lot of changes happening. And you know, COVID has done this for telehealth in mental health, all aspects of other types of health, and you know, oculars certainly going down that path as well. So I hope we answered that question, Bob. Yeah, certainly. And we, we can always evaluate the state that you're in and, and let you know what our, our legal team has to say about uh, particular um, laws or regulations in your particular state. We're currently operational in 21 states. Uh, there are three restricted states. So as we expand, we get our doctors that are either licensed or we bring on additional doctors to, to uh, provide the coverage in those particular areas. So hopefully that, that answers your question, but of course, feel free to write in. We have a number of questions that have come in, so maybe we'll, we'll try to get through these a little bit quicker. Uh, so sure. definitely appreciate ev everyone's interest. Um, let's kind of go on to the next one. And, and we, we probably answered a few other questions in there along the way as well. So we can, you know, I, you know, I'm just kind of scrolling through here, but how about you get, um, how about we cover this one for Andre Lenore, I believe it's, um, how similar is this to iLab? Let's talk a little bit about the, um, the different types of teleoptometry that are out there. And the, I guess the difference again, kind of touch on um, the difference between like a, a comprehensive eye exam that you're billing medically for. Mike, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, so Andre is uh, from Atlanta, or he used to be. I hope that he still is. I haven't seen him in quite some time, but my eye lab is getting a lot of attention from the uh, Georgia Optometric Association, and uh, and the news has been on them. And I and I've got to say that I do not know much about them. I've heard what the GOA has been saying and and what they've been doing. And my understanding is, and again, I'm I'm not an expert, but they don't provide this synchronous care. As far as I know, the, the biggest difference is, is they, don't, um, they don't have the doctor and the patient connect. And that's one thing that I think is the critical point and the, the point that takes this from making it an awesome thing to just an unacceptable thing is the patient and the doctor talking to each other to express concerns, review findings, and come up with a treatment plan together. Uh, that's what I think that the difference is. And um, the difference in this in medical exams, you know, is – um, mostly when we do this, they're vision exams. And if we find something that we need, that needs medical care, they come back and we're doing most of that in person. Um, but again, you know, we're, we're, it, it's still just the interaction and you're utilizing the data, but, but I'm not sure if that's what, uh, Andre was asking, how do you compare it to, uh, medical exams? Um, that's okay, Mike. I misspoke on that. I was looking at the other question too, but the, um, in terms of billing for a vision care plan for a comprehensive exam, which is, a, it's kind of, a, I was tr trying to combine a couple of questions there. So there are some forms of teleoptometry out there that are kind of doing, they're doing refraction only, or they may be doing, you know, like you said, asynchronous care where the doctor's not, you know, a doctor's not involved or they're doing a write-off afterwards on a, on just a refraction on a script. So I was just asking, kind of touch on that. Perhaps Chad, you can kind of, if you're more familiar with that particular service or, and or some other services that might fall. In, and we could also kind of, may, maybe from there, Chad, if you touch on that, and then you can jump into uh, Chris Swanson's question regarding procedural codes and reimbursements. We could talk a little bit about how do you bill for this? Is there any difference? Modifiers, sure. could we kind of get into that part of the discussion? So I won't pick on any particular company out there. I'll just kind of talk in more generalizations, but I think uh, what everybody needs to understand is there's a standard of care that the AOA puts out, that states put out, um, and at 2020, we're trying to make sure that we meet or exceed all of them. So if we, if we meet the toughest of those standards, we know we're going to meet the rest of them, right? And so synchronous versus asynchronous is very important. The, the vision plans that have looked at this so far 
um, they do want a face-to-face -face interaction. So if you don't have the doctor coming on screen, it's not going to get paid for at least down the road. So they, they may be that, you know, the VSPs are paying for it right now, but eventually they won't. You'll have to have that. Um, and Mike has put it out there perfectly of why it's so good and necessary. Um, but that's what you're going to have to have as a minimum uh, to get paid from the vision exam. So, so we already meet that. So from a standard of care, I think that's why I chose 2020 versus, you know, working with anybody else is that they meet or exceed it. Right now, um, you're just, you're, the billing is the same. Uh, NAVCP has come out with a position paper. Um, it's favorable to telehealth. Um, right now, IMED, VSP, none of them have come out with direct position papers, but they are part of NAVCP. So they were part of writing that up. But right now you'd bill it just like you would any other um, exam. Eventually there may be a modifier just so that they know. Um, there are a couple plans that will have um, our doctors sign an attestation that they are doing remote exams because they'll, so we'll say one of our doctors, uh, you know, Dr. Mike brought up a couple of our doctors. They are um, credentialed under his location but they're also, you know, may live in another state. So the vision plan will once in a while ask, you know, how can you be doing exams over here if you live over there? And then they sign an attestation that they're performing those remotely. Everything to my knowledge has been paid for up until this point. Have you had anything, Mike, be rejected? No, we haven't. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that's, a lot of people are talking about it and they're trying to, uh, that paper that you're talking about uh, from the uh, National Association of Vision Care Plans was years in the making. And the AOA just came out with a new position paper that they were working on kind of before COVID. Actually, that was actually my last trip before COVID was to the AOA to talk about their new position paper on these telehealth things. So I, I love the discussion about it and I love that everybody's talking about it. And, um, and trying to find ways to deliver care. I, what I've been excited about is trying to get the word out and saying, we are going to do this at a very high level. It can be done. Let's see how good we can be at it. And is, is it possible that it's better in some ways than actually being in person? And the answer to that is yes. In some ways, it's better. Some ways, not as good. And so let's, let's take what's the best about it and, and try to minimize the things that aren't as good about it. And again, I don't think anybody is talking about this replacing in-person personal care is to supplement it. And that's what's exciting. And if we can get over, you know, I'm, they're not going to need me anymore. Yes, they are. They're going to need us. They're going to need us. Right. And, uh, and, and it's that clinical judgment that we've got to make sure stays in the middle of it uh, so that we're, we're not getting compared to the ones that are, um, are, are doing the things that we're not proud of. Yeah, that's great. I was well, going to ask you. It's to back actually, to all that. It's about access. It's about know, access. We've, we've got to get people. My my entire career lately for the last five plus years, and I plan the rest of my career, is to how do I drive eye exams? We want people to get off their couches and into our chairs because they're, we're missing too many things by people just not having eye exams. The dentists have it right. You know, you go in every six months for a cleaning, but if you can get a patient to come in every couple of years to have an eye exam, you know, we feel that we're, we're doing good, but we've got to really push annual eye exams. But if I were to push annual eye exams, do we have enough optometrists to be able to see all of these exams? I don't think we do. And so the access would then get denied. So opening up access to do, as Mike said, the meat and potatoes type so that we can then diagnose the diabetics, the glaucoma, everything else that comes on that needs that medical care. I want doctors to be doing as much medically as we possibly can, but we have to get through those meat and potatoes ones, as Mike was saying. So 
we we've got to increase the access and that's where i think you know telehealth wins uh we're able to provide that sure mike i was going to ask you to kind of expand um Jeffrey Hackleman had asked a couple questions that kind of go along this. They were, he was asking, uh, can you identify any shortcomings in the 2020 now system? And, you know, I think we kind of touched a little bit on segmenting out these different types, but uh, along with uh, how does a comprehensive exam for contact lens wearers differ from a comp exam without contact lens wear? So maybe Chad, you could touch on, on that part in terms of what we're doing by state there and then on the contact lens side, and then also maybe expand on your experience um, and any any particular place where the teleoptometry um, exam that we're providing wouldn't be the right place. I know we've already talked about foreign body removals and some of the other medical, but if you could just expand on that for, for Jeffrey. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, ahead? so uh, in Georgia, you know, it's, it's uh, let, let, let me just say, so we're following the rules to make sure that everything is done properly. And so what we're doing with contact lens patients is making sure that I'm there uh, particularly if we're, we're changing anything and if I, um, and doing those on days when I am available and most of the time I am the, um, but it, the way that you can take care of it, if you think about how contact lenses are fit now and think about all the things that you use. So, so we've got topography, which is something that can be uploaded. Um, over refractions can be done by technicians in my practice. Um, whether I'm there or not over refractions, and contact lens progress exams is what we call them, and contact lens adjustments, contact lens fittings are fit by staff members. You know, you adjust the power by using flippers um, and evaluate the fit of the contact lenses. But through this technology, if you want to, you can capture a slit lamp video, just a few seconds. So a slit lamp image is captured of a contact lens on an eye and you can judge the rotation, you can judge the movement, and you can see if there's any irregularities on there. So it can be done uh, successfully. You just have to have the, the process and the routine to make sure that, okay, the, the doctor uh, looks at the refraction, looks at the K readings, decides on the trial lens, trial lens is put on a patient, um, and then it can be evaluated by however your staff normally does it, whether the staff does it and gives the information to make the adjustment or whether an image is captured and sent to the doctor or you save it for when the doctor is available. Um, and licensed opticians, of course, if those are on your staff, that, that could uh, be beneficial in that situation as well. Basically, it's a long answer to say it depends on your individual situation. Right. It depends also on your state. So, Mike, I know you're in a state where there are licensed opticians that can fit contact lenses. Right. Um, so you, you got to know, obviously, your state uh, regulations here. What I'll get into is 2020 now can do every part of the eye exam that you would need as a doctor to make the determination which contact you want to, to fit on that patient and how does it perform. So Mike was talking about, uh, you, you said both of them, but I want to make sure everybody understands you can do video and you can do still pictures. You have the capability of both of them. So, you know, if you want to see how a contact moves, you want to see what the rotation is, you know, you can have them looking straight ahead for a little while. You can then have them look up and blink. I can give my doctors everything that they possibly need. The only thing in some states that's holding us back is actually more on the optician side of things. It's the insertion and removal part of it. Um, so we're, we're working through that. We Right now, may, you may be in a state that we can't do um, new contact lens fits, but we're, we're growing. <laughs> it's happening. Uh, but it's not because of, you know, 2020 now's exam process. Um, Mike covered all the ways that you may want it. 2020 is very flexible and can get you all of that information. I just need to know what state you're in so that, you know, I can tell you, no, you can't do it because you have to be on premise or yes, you can do it. And this is how you're going to do it. Yeah, the best way for us to dig into that is just to have an offline conversation where I can, I can get you the specific regulations for each of each of your states. Uh, 
let's kind of jump through a couple of these. I know, I know we still have a, a bunch of questions to go through. Uh, Jerry Ellis asked, asked another question in terms of um, what would you not consider appropriate for teleoptometry, which we've touched on, but um, it, he specifically mentioned age and diseases. Um, Chad, do, do you just want to give a quick rundown on the uh, the three hard stops for a comprehensive exam? Sure. Yeah, we've uh, we've set three hard stops, and one of them is is age, and we've set it as ten years old. But we've also let our clients adjust that if they feel that they're they want to. But at some point, I think we we have to set a an age because you know we we can't necessarily get the subjective refraction the way we want to. We can't get them to sit still. There may be a seven-year-old that sits still better than a 40-year-old, right? Um, but we've had to make that as a determination. Um, a second hard stop is a new contact lens fit, except in those states, as we just talked about, that we can do it. And then the third is if you've had surgery or an injury recently, uh, we want you to make sure that you know, you've followed up with whoever is providing that care and make sure that they're okay with you then going forward. You know, you may have had, you know, let's just make it an easy one, a cataract surgery, um, but it's not ready yet to get the refraction and get your glasses yet. You know, patients are pushing, they want, they want that new pair of glasses because they can't see out of that eye. But, you know, we want to uh, make sure that either the ophthalmologist or the optometrist that's taking care of that individual has signed off before we're going to do it. So those are our three hard stops right now. The one question I get from a lot of doctors, and I'll just preemptively answer it right now, is about diabetics. And a lot of them think that that should be a hard stop, that we shouldn't even start the exam. And I've taken a little different approach on that because I know how many people do not come in to have an eye exam. So if we're able to get someone into the chair and we're able, oftentimes they don't know they're diabetic and we're the ones telling them that we believe that they are. So I would rather catch them and not let them fall through the cracks and then refer them for the additional care that they need than them not be seen at all. So that's the stance that I've taken on it. Uh, it. It may be that, you know, we have a discussion about that, but I'm pretty passionate that I want those people in our chair because we're going to find with all the equipment that we have, uh, we haven't even touched on the uh, AI that we use. So we run every fundus photo through an AI program and it will circle microaneurysms that oftentimes can't even be seen by a human. Um, so I think we're doing an even better job as Mike kind of touched on that a little bit sometimes. And I think AI is one of them because I don't know too many private practitioners that have uh, an AI program that they're able to run it through. So, um, so diabetics are not a hard stop. We will start all of those exams. They may be referred depending on what we find, but I, again, I'd rather do that and make sure that that person is taken care of. Hey, the, speaking of diabetes, this is perfect for people with diabetes because, I mean, you get a good refraction, you can see if their vision's good, you can check the pressure, and you get a retinal photo that can be analyzed by an eye care professional. But let me tell you the big movement. I've been a member of the American Telemedicine Association for a couple of years now, and a big movement in all of telehealth is, in, in eye care, is retinal cameras being sold to primary care doctors. All retinal camera manufacturers are selling cameras to uh, diabetes doctors and they're taking these pictures and uploading them. And that's the only evaluation of diabetic eye health that they're getting. And so we can do that as a part of this exam, but it goes to access. There are lots, I don't know the numbers. I was gonna say a number, I don't even know the yeah. number. There are lots of people with diabetes that can't get eye exams for a number of reasons, whether it's insurance or whether it's how far away they live. And so this is one of those things that at least we can find the ones with diabetic. It's a, it's a big problem for us. So improving the access is my primary motivation in all of this. Is, and I think that everybody who stays involved, if you honestly, sincerely are putting your patients first and honestly trying to give them good care, you're gonna find a way to deliver it. 
That's great. We, so we, we have a well, number so. of questions. I would, I would love for um, Michael Cooper to, to possibly come on live here. So Michael, if you're open to it, just drop an answer in the chat that says, uh, says live because you have, um, you've asked like seven questions here. So I, I, I we're, we're going to have to rattle through them for you, but would love for you to come up and have a dialogue. Um, Jeff Poe has asked a couple questions. We'll do that one. We'll, we'll do those first. Um, I'm kind of going to, I'm going to take them out of order. Uh, does 2020 now train techs up to become certified to do the refraction or am I training my own staff and do states have any standards for certification? So kind of two parts here. Uh, number one, we are flexible in what we can do. So just, just to let you know, I'll answer kind of the first part and then kick it over to Chad. We can provide the professional services of the remote refraction with the technicians that the average has, Chad, I believe over 10 years of, of, uh, of you know, experience and certification. We can also provide the doctors to do the, the remote consultation or in a practice that has multiple doctors, multiple locations, maybe they have additional associates that can cover, um, that can cover the clinical consult or they have technicians that could do the, the refraction on site. We can do a blend. And so we can talk about, um, again, these are some different business models that we engage in where it can be anything from us providing the professional services and the fees associated with that, which on average would be around $45 uh, per exam if we did everything on the professional services side. It's a tiered pricing, starts at $55 and goes down $10 per tier. And so again, we can get into your particulars, but so on average, it would be around $45 per exam over the course of a month. So we can provide that full comprehensive uh, exam in terms of the the clinical, in terms of the, the refraction and the clinical consult by the doctor with your on-site technician doing the normal pretest that they usually do. We provide three to five days of in-office training, depending on the experience level of your technician, to train them up on certain areas or certain tests that they might not have been comfortable with. So I, I know I kind of covered a, a number of things there. Chad, if you wanted to kind of jump in on anything in terms of um, I think somebody removed that question. Uh, from Let me just touch on the, the refractionists. You know, they, they are Jacopo certified. They're either COTs or COMTs. I don't know if you're going to do this. I don't know why you wouldn't use 2020 now's refractionist because they're, they're really good. Um, they have less than a 1.5% remake rate. So you're not going to be eating a lot of glasses from the dispensary or anything like that. Um, but it, it comes as part of it. So, you know, you might as well take advantage of that. Um, once, once doctors get, uh, you know, comfortable with that idea, uh, I think they're good with that. So many of us aren't doing our own refractions anymore anyway. Um, so we're okay giving that up and doing more of the tertiary care, uh, the medical part of it. So, that's that's where I'm at, Mike. I don't know if you have uh, anything else you'd like to say. Yeah, you know, I think that hits the nail on the head really strongly. I think, again, it just goes down to um, doing what you can with what you've got uh, with the primary motivation being taking good care of the, the patient that's in front of you. Mike, do you want to cover the second part of Jeff's question, which was uh, what does a doctor's schedule look like? Are, are you seeing in-person patients and remote patients? How balanced teleoptometry with medical patients or post-op follow-up? I know you kind of touched on that a little bit. And maybe you could also share some experience based off of, off of how it might be. In a, you're, you're in a solo practice yourself at this point. Maybe how it would look across a multi-location as well, yeah. you know, multi-doctors, multi or if you just want to kind of give a couple different scenarios based off of your experience. So, so my experience has been that, you know, I set this up as I call it my research and development practice because I wanted to see how good we could possibly make it. So right at the beginning, I was the doctor. So so I would do all of the doctor part of the exams as we started this process. Sometimes I would be literally across the hall on my laptop seeing a patient and I would do their exam and then I would walk in and talk to him and say, hey, how'd you like that? What did you like about me being on this screen? And and, and those kind of things, just trying to get it better. Then it became sort of a blended where I would see patients and, um, and have the 2020 now doctor see the patients kind of at the same time. But our office is really too small for that uh, to be able to, to utilize both. But in practices, my former practice, which was a big primary care practice with multiple exam rooms, that's where I could see it really benefiting. And you could do 
uh, see your standard patients and let new patients be seen there or um, just blend it however you want to. And, and also the set, the beauty of it is when you start talking about ways that you can use it, if you let your imagination go, there's just limitless ways that you can use this. So let's say you've got five satellite offices and one big primary office you could put in this, you've got this technology in there. You could see patients when the volume is not high enough for you to be in there. You could remote in periodically. And if it's a foreign body or if it's something that needs a referral, they could come into the big office. Um, I, I, I've, I know I'm trying to cut myself short because I know we're running out of time and I know there's a, a long list of unanswered questions. But when you talk about the ways that you can use it, that really is it's just a, a discussion that can go on and on and on. And the doctors who are are like me are always looking for ways to make it better. And you don't settle. Right. You, you, you implement it. You say, well, how could we do that a little bit better? You're not going to let things slip by because you're providing inadequate care. You are going to make sure that the team is doing it well. Yeah, that's great. We, I mean, we could also answer, so we've kind of partially answered some of Michael Cooper's questions. Uh, another question up here, he's got a couple in a row. Please explain fees to use your technology, which we kind of touched on there. How's the independent OD make out financially? Bottom line, more exams, increased exam capacity leads to increased optical sales, as well as increased medical so you're basically, you know, as Chad and Mike have touched on, able to, to duplicate yourself, take care of more of the, the routine comprehensive exams that uh, result in either, you know, increased medical contact lens or, or optical sales. So that's kind of the, the base point. We can um, have a conversation offline and, and kind of go over your practice individually. I can do more of a perspective for you. Chad? Well, and I would drive them to 2020 Now's website. There's a financial calculator that you can put in your own numbers. You know, what, what is your, your average uh, sale from uh, the dispensary optical side of things? How many exams would you be seeing? Um, and it'll kick out, you know, a number for you. You know, there's medical on there as well. So you can play with that. Um, you know, it's, we certainly, you know, Bob, I, I know you, you could go over a lot of this with them as well, but I think uh, everybody that goes on and fills in some of their own information first, it's a whole lot easier for me than to have a conversation with, uh, with you after you kind of have an idea of what things would be. Yeah. I would say that if you're looking to expand your practice in any way, say that you're busy as you want to be, uh, and you don't want to take Fridays off, you could do this on Fridays or Saturdays or evenings and, uh, and still see the patients and know that, that things are happening and your, your wait list, your, the, the length of time that patients have to wait to see you could actually go down instead of growing. If you want to buy that practice in the remote area, but you don't want to work it, if you will, if you've been trying to hire an associate and can't, if you've got somebody going on maternity leave, these are all opportunities that you could work in. So the financial perspective is just like hiring a doctor to be in there uh, and, and, uh, and working it that way. So anyway, that's just a, another thought. And I wanted to share something um, I know we don't have, and I'm happy to stay as long as you guys like, but as far as the access to care early on in this process, we had a patient that came. And again, I was thinking this was going to be attractive to millennials. That's who I thought our practice was going to be overwhelmed by. And that's not been the case. It's been people who have, um, have, ha are thrilled that there's somebody finally close to them that they can, uh, they can check their eyes. But there was one gentleman that came in who was diabetic and he was newly diabetic. He was 65 something and um and he had kind of been neglecting his health his whole life so he just recently found out he had diabetes um wasn't really going to the doctor and what i realized about him is he did not know how to work the healthcare system he did not know how to fill out questionnaires and he was embarrassed by that and i realized that we need that part of the access to healthcare problem is making people who need health care feel welcome to come in there just to get started, just somebody. So we were helping him uh, just by checking his eyes. He, you know, he did. I can't remember if he had diabetic retinopathy or not, but nonetheless, he needed somebody to just sort of introduce him to his, reintroduce him to his doctor and get him back in that uh, health care system. And we have sort of turned into the practice that is, 
is giving to our community more that way than, um, than I ever expected. A great story. Thanks, Mike. That's great. Michael Cooper also asked about um, some integration with iFinity, Office Made Exam Writer. So, so in terms of in terms of integrating with EMRs, I'll just let you know. Broadly speaking, I mean we're a software company, so we have a team of software engineers internally. We can integrate with pretty much any system that you have provided that they're willing to communicate with us and give us the the access. So, generally speaking, the answer is yes to most any uh, EHR system that that you may have. And uh, so hopefully that we, again, we can take that one um, offline one-on-one -on -one is, is kind of the best way to answer that, but hopefully just to give you an overview. And Douglas Walker asked, are you looking for 2020 now doctors or more locations? So certainly, you know, as we expand, we have a, a, um, a number of resumes internally. Um, we get them frequently. So that's great. Obviously a lot of interest from doctors looking to, to provide, provide the exams as well. But then of course, obviously looking to expand our, our customer base, of course. So um, certainly we're looking for locations where, you know, offices, private practices that want to offer this service where we are a vendor for you. That is the primary goal of today's, today's call. We'll go on to uh, Larry Brown. It seems um, examining the peripheral fundus might be the biggest technical challenge for tele-examinations. Uh, Dr. Rothschild, you have impressive instrumentation, but does this vary a lot from user to user? Is this capability required of 2020 now affiliate? So great question. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of go into that. I think I'll, I'll kick this one over to, to Dr. Chad, of course, in terms of what's the, what's the minimum requirement from the company in terms of doing a um, non-dilated teleoptometry exam regarding uh, fundus camera and then what's kind of the average. Certainly, Dr. Rothschild is way above average with both a uh, wide field center view and an, and an ultra wide field OptiMap, right? That is not a requirement. So we just want to be sure of that, but um, it's certainly great when everyone has that, that capability, but kick that over to you, Dr. Chad. Yeah, I kind of touched on it earlier that, you know, I want at the very minimum a wide field camera, you know, that, cause we're going to again, run this through the AI to Larry's point, you know, that may or may not get enough in the periphery um, but, you know, if you're going to get at least a wide field, um, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable. I, I got to tell you, there's an awful lot of our colleagues that, you know, aren't dilating people right now, do not do fundus photos. They may just be doing a direct or a 90, um, you know, so I'd like to elevate them to at least a wide field uh, fundus as well, and then add the AI to it. Um, so that's, again, that, that'd be my answer to the very minimum. We can go all the way up to what Mike is doing, of course, as well. Um, but I believe if you get a good wide field view, you're gonna get a very good idea of what's going on. Um, but if, you know, if they, say that they've had flashes or floaters or have had trauma at some point, we're going to refer. I mean, that's, uh, we're going to refer for a dilated eye exam. I think our doctors do a very good job of referring and coming on and talking to the patient of why they're being referred. And then we also have an individual that follows up to make sure that they actually went to their visit. So we're going above and beyond, I think, of what most would do because, you know, I don't know, Mike, maybe you got somebody in your office that follows up everybody that you send for retina, cataract, whatever, but uh, I think it's a extremely good what 2020 now is doing for that. You know, it, it all depends on the individual patient, what is good enough. You know, you got a 20 year old who's healthy, who's been dilated every year, you know, for an established practice, you know, your established patients, you can decide, you know, who's appropriate for this. But if they're a new patient, they're a minus eight, you know, and then the doctor can make the determination. Look, that combination for someone we've never seen before, this is not going to be adequate. We're going to have to come back and let somebody uh, dilate this patient and, and look at them properly. So again, every single patient that you're able to look at, if you keep their their best interest in mind and the 2020 now doctors do that, you're going to make sure they get the good care that they need. Yeah, good point. It's just, you're gonna, maybe you're going to refer them to yourself, you know, on the day that you're in the office. You do that all the time. You refer them to yourself. Right. 
We have just a, a couple more questions here. It's great. Appreciate so many people staying on. And, uh, you know, so certainly a pleasure. Michael Cooper with a string of questions here. So do you have a comprehensive list of compatible equipment and software? Again, easiest way is for us to just take it offline where um, we, I could just go down the make and model that you have. That would be the quickest and shortest way to do it. Um, so just making models of the existing equipment that you have, and, and we can do that one quickly uh, versus, I mean, like I said, we integrate with 18 different OEMs and just lists of, of all the makes and models there. Um, I'm told the OD patient video at conclusion of exam must be recorded. Is that correct? No. I don't, must be recorded. I'm not sure I understand the question. It's, it's my understanding. I think that what they're asking is, is do you have to record the interaction between the doctor and the patient? The answer to that is no. Is I think that's a HIPAA violation to, uh, to do that anyway. But we're, you don't record the, uh, the interaction. Okay, that's great. And in terms of how many aggregate remote exams or fraction does 2020 now have under its belt? Broadly speaking, we can tell you it's over 2.5 million in which the software that we have that we have IP rights on has been used. And um, so kind of kind of a, a lot of a lot of experience there over several years. 2020 now has actually been around for for quite a number of years. Uh, most of that in, in early development with that software uh, being tested, of course, so we can kind of again, uh, always, always have a chat about other things offline. So I think we've gone through all the list of questions. Want to thank everyone for, for their time this evening. If anyone has any questions, can always email me, reach out and contact us. We have videos on YouTube of the exam process that I forwarded on Friday, I believe. So certainly a pleasure. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you to Dr. Overman and Dr. Rothschild as well. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Look forward to, to doing the next Thanks. Slide. Yeah, let's do this again. This was fun. Absolutely. Thank Take care. Guys. Bye. Bye. Night.